So when we're talking bottom up, this is much more like what I did on my very first project. I got interested in, this was my very first time as a project manager. I had no idea what the right way to start a project was. And I had a, I had a, a host of different options. I could do waterfall, and I knew what that felt like. I'd been through that, I'd lived that already. But then there was iterative, and there was Scrum, and there was XP, and these new agile methods. I said, oh yeah, let's, let's try XP. That looked like a winner. I read the book, and I gave it to the team, and we sat down together as a team, and the team fell in love with it. They thought it was awesome. Okay, great, let's give it a try. And so it was just our team. No one else in the company was doing it. CEO had no idea what it was, didn't care. All he wanted was his product, okay? And so we launched that, and it was just us, just our little 10-person bubble within the company. And then other teams saw what we were doing, and they wanted to know how we were doing it, and they started asking questions. You started getting stopped in the hallway saying, that's amazing, what is that? That kind of thing. And it started to spread from there. And then it started to attract the CEO and others. It got their attention because all of a sudden we're delivering where you know, we had been stalled before. Things are looking pretty good. What are these guys doing? You know, well, we're doing this XP thing. So that's what bottom-up transformation felt like to me on my first project. CEO never knew. There was no big proposal. It was just those of us in the room doing the work. And there are some characteristics of these bottom-up transformations. Uh, in general, the technical practices are adopted first. That happens very early. You get things like continuous integration, continuous delivery, and they come along because the developers are passionate about those. You get refactoring, test-driven development, pairing, because this is techie stuff. This is happening down at the team level. This is what attracts the developers. So they fall in love with that first, and they change the way they're working, and they kind of fall in love with it. So you get the technical practices, you get the engagement from the team, and they're using the process as well, but the focus isn't nearly as much on the process. We're using user stories, but there are other people in the organization who are still confused about what, what a user story is or perhaps don't even care. You may be translating those things as they come into your team. You're doing refactoring. So refactoring is where we are constantly looking back at the code we have already written. Maybe we're working on a legacy system. And if we're working on a legacy system, we've got areas that are messed up code, spaghetti code, that needs to be re rewritten reorganized so that we can move faster, so that as a team we can de develop quicker. And so these teams tend to adopt refactoring as a practice. And test-driven development. So we start the process of writing the tests first rather than writing them afterwards. In test-driven development, we take the testing that usually happens at the end and we drag it all the way forward in the process so we write the test first. When we write the test first, what happens when we run the test? They fail, all right? And so they fail, and now our job is to write the code until the test pass. So we'll start off with a bunch of tests that fail, and we'll write a little code, and then maybe one of those tests is now passing. Now we have an indication, an objective, empirical indication of what's working and what's not on our project. And our goal is to get everything green, working, all of our tests passing as quickly as we can. And there's pair programming. And this to me is, is about learning and sharing learning across a team. So I'll give you an example. Oftentimes, uh, when we bring someone onto a project, we're working on, on very important stuff. Uh, when I was working for the financial services industry, um, if we make a mistake and get the decimal place in the wrong place on a financial transaction, that has huge impact. There's huge liability associated with it. Customers are impacted. It's a scary thing. So we were very, very cautious 
about bringing people onto our teams and letting them touch the code. So in our case, we might go upwards of 30 days, two months, three months before we actually let someone touch something really important. How many folks take a month before they let someone touch the code? Getting them trained up, getting them oriented. Two months? Three months? I see a head or two nodding. All right. So, what's that? First day? Exactly. Exactly. That's what we want. And pair programming is, is, is the way that we do that. And on projects where we use pair programming, people are writing production code the day they join. And that's because they're doing it basically with a Sherpa. They're doing it with someone who's with them every step of the way. They're paired up with somebody who's showing them around. If you're looking to transfer knowledge and bring people onto teams quickly, there is no better mechanism than pair programming. Okay, so that's what it is. It's an adoption mechanism. It's a learning mechanism. I don't know if it's, I'm not going to make the case here that it, 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 it markedly improves the quality of your code or speeds you up or anything like that. But if you want to bring people on board fast, it does that. That part it does. If you want to train other people and get cross training within your team, it does that. And it does that really fast. And those are important things. Those are critical things to teams that are high performing. And ultimately, it probably will lead to some performance improvement by eliminating bottlenecks, if nothing else. So that's what pair programming is all about. So some of the benefits of these bottom-up transformations, where you're just starting off with your, your own little team in your own little area, you get high within the, within the team, you get great adoption. Okay, Everybody's on board. And you get very passionate engagement. So the people who are making it work are going to sell like crazy. So these folks tend to be really, really engaged. So when you get this high team adoption, you start getting people who are really starting to value working together closely on these big projects. And that builds these really tight teams that are really, really engaged. And the only sort of downside to that is they're very inward facing. Okay, the team becomes king, and you have to watch out for that as you do this because ultimately you're probably working in an ecosystem. You're probably working with other teams, and we need to make sure that these teams become well behaved citizens within that ecosystem so that they're not purely focused on themselves, but also focused on how they're integrating with the rest of the group. That's one of the hazards of these bottom up transformations. And of course, I've never seen people who are more passionately engaged than teams that have started with bottom-up transformations. As opposed to what you see the other way around when you do top-down transformations, that's the boss said do it. That's the boss said, I like Agile, let's do that. And you get skeptical developers who may have been working within a culture that frankly might have been abusive at the extreme, who are looking at the boss saying, this is just a gimmick to get me to go faster. This is just a gimmick to get me to work harder. Sprinting? Are you kidding? So you have to watch out for that, because oftentimes these top-down transformations are hard to sell to the folks who are working, doing the work. As opposed to bottom-up, where oftentimes you get them in. They're, 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 they're all in. They love it. They think this is awesome. This is fabulous. So you want to take advantage of that. There are a few problems with these bottom-up transformations. One is simply the legacy subsystems. And I, you, you probably have that for, for, for both of these kinds of transformations. Uh, but the, the, the teams that are, that are directly touching the code are the ones who are going to find that uh, the technical debt can be overwhelming. Absolutely overwhelming. I think people consistently underestimate just how bad technical debt can be and just how much time they need to deal with it. You can do simulations, and the simulations aren't the real thing, but they reflect my reality, which is that if you don't spend significant amounts of time 
working on dealing with technical debt and refactoring on projects, especially early on on legacy projects, you will not get the benefit you're looking for. Uh, oftentimes it gets over overwhelming very, very quickly and you spend all of your time maintaining and unable to deliver new features. You get over engineering, gold plating, and the guidance and coordination that you might see in a top-down transformation uh, is less likely, not impossible, but less likely with a bottom-up transformation. Because you're thinking, like I pointed out earlier, very inwardly um, within my team or my group of teams. And so people are usually not focused outside of the team in these transformations. So these legacy subsystems, we see that over and over, and it's, it's, it's things like um, uh, old code, it is, it is spaghetti code, it is old systems that have been around forever, and they're usually critical to the business. They're usually cash cows. So you can't just walk away from them. Uh, I would love to say that, that uh, uh, this is all solved by doing greenfield projects, uh, but that's simply not the case. You have this problem even with greenfield projects. As soon as you write the code, especially if you don't write tests for it, it becomes legacy code. So it happens with disturbing speed. So keeping up with that is something that over time I've learned we need to keep a vigilant eye out for. Over engineering, one of the first big projects you know, the scaling stuff that we've seen over the last few years has become very popular, but there's been an evolution. Back in 1998, there was no scaling. There was no even notion of coordinating across teams, except maybe do a scrum of scrums. That'll, that'll be your coordination. And around 2005 or so, we did our first, I think it was five teams working together on a gaming project. And th over the period of about six months, um, they, managed to get into a complete train wreck architecturally because there was no architectural coordination across the teams. Each of the teams was a high-performing Agile team. I knew these people very well, and they were all rock stars. Unfortunately, they knew nothing about coordinating across the teams. And so for the first few months, they delivered code that looked very impressive and everybody was very excited. But then they were unable to get the code to start integrating they didn't have the planning to coordinate that together, and after six months, the project was canceled uh, because it was simply going nowhere. So this is very easy to have happen when you're doing the bottom up. When you're doing top down, there's a little bit more likelihood that you're gonna be coordinating across those groups. Bottom up, it's not impossible. You can watch out for it, uh, but it's more likely. Am I doing that? That's a little scary. Wow. Just a second here. Okay, who's got the remote? So um, aside from that, uh, poor guidance and coordination. So um, I'm sort of leading into that. Um, the, the kinds of structures that have come into place, and one of the, one of the benefits of using less or safe or dad or one of those frameworks is they define roles explicitly around doing that coordination. Someone who is going to play the role of architect, someone who is going to play the role of product manager, someone who is going to play the role of, <laughs> wow, you're seeing this, right? No hands, nothing up my sleeves. So you need, people, you need people to play these coordinating activities. And uh, there we go, ah, so much better. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Good Lord! <sighs> you guys have poltergeists. Oh, that's scary. So those are, those are some of the challenges of doing these bottom-up transformations. Has anyone had uh, similar challenges or maybe things that I haven't mentioned? Who else has done a bottom-up transformation? Anyone? Yeah? principles 
but I don't have the the history and the experience to guide them in it, and nobody else does either. <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of, you know, blind leading the blind kind of situation. And it certainly feels that way the first time around. So you're, you're absolutely right. It, it is kind of scary. Um, the nice thing about a lot of these uh, frameworks is there's an inspect and adapt cycle built in there. And that's, that's what that's there for is for those of us who haven't done it for, you know, done it before, it's the training wheels for us. It's let's try this. I think what I, what I, what I hear underlying what you're talking about is that there's a right way to do this and if I knew that, I could tell the team what it was. I've got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> the good news is um, there are training wheels. There is the inspect and adapt cycle to try things out. The bad news is there's no perfectly well-defined way of getting there. So if you feel a little bit lost, you're doing it right. Uh, so, so that's okay, that's okay. It turns out teams get differing levels of value from adopting some of these practices. There are some teams that really do thrive uh, and do very, very well off of things like refactoring, okay? And there are teams, I, I wish I could give you a formula for rolling out continuous delivery for a given organization, but the fact of the matter is, everybody's using different technology, and so finding your way to that is a little bit of a journey. In fact, one of the things when we're setting up teams so that they can roll things out the door really quickly is that I like them to work it out as manually as possible. What I'm most fearful of are organizations that give me a grand architecture for continuous delivery before they've tried anything, okay? So I, I would watch out for that. What I like to see is let's figure out if we can walk through this together, okay? If we can walk through this manually first and prove out the steps, then we can pick the steps that are the most painful and optimize those. And so when I'm looking at teams doing that, I wanna see them understand the process first before they build very elaborate architectures. So thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. So this question is a little bit different, right? Yeah. I mean, like what I am seeing over time, and this is what I'm talking today, I mean, earlier, people were coding and agile methodology was being used or you know some other methodology. But now most of the vendors are providing uh, Cox products, right? They just provide the modules. Mm -hmm. So can agile methodology be implemented into those modularized Cox systems? Uh, COTS? Yes. Yeah, I don't see why not, uh, really. Uh, but it, 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 I think let's, let's refine that just a little bit before I, I give you the, the, right. the, the blank slate answer. So as a, a process for organizing work, of course Agile can be used. Um, but when it comes right down to the technology, the specific technology, ultimately we have to understand that technology well and know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So if you hand off a new COTS product to a team that's never seen it before, mm -hmm. um, and they have to integrate it into their system, you're starting from square one, as far as I'm concerned. Right. You know, there's a learning process there, okay? Now, you've got a couple of different options there, uh, in my experience. One is you know the vendor. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have some sort of re uh, existing relationship with the vendor. Mm -hmm. That's good, mm -hmm. that's really good, because then you have people that you can talk to and relationships you can build, that will accelerate that process. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that people connection, then it's gonna be much slower as people kind of feel their way through it. One of the things, one of the products that uh, we first developed on one of my first projects was, uh, was a printing product mm -hmm. that had to automatically align packages to optimize paper waste, mm -hmm. you know, on, on, on sheets of printed paper. Mm -hmm. Well, we bought a component from some guys in India, mm -hmm. um, and we really didn't have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And the component worked awesome. It worked great. Uh, but we had to stumble through figuring out how to use it mm -hmm. and integrate it into our product which took a long time for us. Probably would have been a lot better if we had actually had some, some relationships. That, does that yeah. resonate? Th th that's correct. I mean, like, also, like, going future, I mean, are you seeing more, like, uh, code starting from the grounds up, or are you also seeing, like, technologies moving towards, like, the just the ready-made code is provided? Plugging, plugging yeah. pieces together. Right. 
I think it's a little bit of uh, what, what I see are there's more and more pieces, you know, uh, opportunities, hunks of components to, to link together, and that's good and bad. I don't have to write them anymore, but there's a bewildering array of them out there to understand. Mm -hmm. So many, in fact, that I lose track, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so, so I think the complexity has changed. Uh, rather than having to write the component myself now, I don't have to do that. But I still have to understand the ecosystem that it's working in. And so I think the complexity has changed and moved around a bit. Right. Uh, it's still just as daunting. Got yeah. it. Yeah. So fortunately, that means we all have jobs. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So going back to, to, to wrapping this up, we've talked a little bit about some of the pros and cons of doing this top down, which there are some obvious advantages, some obvious disadvantages. We've talked about bottom up and some of the pros and cons to doing it that way. Obviously, the right answer is somewhere in between, right? When we do this, we want to engage with the executives early on. There's real value in doing that. There are models for introducing change in organizations, whether you're using Cotter's eight-step model, that would be one model. There are lots of change models, and many of those change models are very useful, and often they're organized around top-down sorts of, of, of change processes. At the same time, there is nothing better for engaging the teams and getting the technical ball rolling. In fact, it's where I prefer to go many times, which is let's get the team started, get the ability to deliver working first. Get us able to deliver, and then we can talk about getting folks in layers above that starting to organize their work. So there's very real value, essential value, in making sure that you can get the teams working and get the flow to production working first before you get a bunch of managers pounding on the desk saying, where's my product, okay? So there's value in doing it both ways, and you just have to be aware of some of the trade-offs as you do this. And obviously the organization that I come from has done a lot in terms of trying to understand the best way to roll these things out, and I'm sure you have your own approaches as well. Any other questions? Yes. And um, sometimes I think that the newer technologies are, you know, um, hard are hard to sell mm -hmm. to management. But um, uh, I, another a question I have with regard to um, your experience is whether you um, s like to see a blend or uh, the requirements uh, development, the definition of the requirements, be iterative along with the development of the product. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there's there's an element to this that I'm particularly, I mean, we, we've really seen evolve over the last couple of years. Um, it used to be we just focused on the team, you know, and getting the team to break down the work. Now we've come to realize that that's just part of the problem. If they're working on the wrong thing, then we're not any better off. So it's not enough to get the teams really good, optimize the team for breaking down work and delivering work. We need to understand the customer. And that is something called customer development understanding the customer's needs really well. And there are some fascinating frameworks there that have come into being in recent years. Um, there's one uh, uh, called Jobs to be Done, which is a, a, a framework for understanding how, what, what the needs of the customer really are so that we deliver, the, we have a fighting chance for delivering the right thing. So I'd recommend looking at that. Uh, another one is Lean Startup, testing with the customer releasing MVPs, minimum viable product, okay? That kind, or minimum, minimal viable features. So you're testing your customer market because you don't know. You don't know in advance what the right product is. You don't have a crystal ball. It is a game where we're learning about the market and then we're shipping things quickly to the market to validate those assumptions. So, great question. Any other questions? All righty. Thank you very much for your time. It was great. <laughs>